Can we close the doors now, please? Should we just shut the doors now? Yes. Uh, welcome on behalf of the India International Center and Jan Prasad. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow members of IIC and Jan Prasad to the discussion on Manipur crisis and the role of media. This conversation marks the 33rd anniversary of the presidential ascent to the Prasar Bharti Act 1990 and is the 30th discussion in Jan Prasad's annual series. This is also the 30th anniversary of Jan Prasad which was founded in 1994 as a civil society initiative to advocate an independent public service broadcaster in India. And we would like to take this opportunity to thank IIC for, the, for collaborating with us for the past 30 years to carry forward the idea of public service broadcasting and its values all these years, and also commemoration of 12th November every year as the Public Service Broadcasting Day to mark Gandhiji's only broadcast on All India Radio on 12th November 1947, and also the day 12th November of 1942, when Usha Mehta was arrested for running the Congress Radio, also known as Azad Radio, an underground radio station that operated during the Quick India movement. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, an underground radio station that operated during the Quit India movement in uh, of uh, 1942. Since Jan Prasar has taken a position that there is no public service broadcaster in the country today, but just a pretender, we mark the occasion of the anniversary of the presidential ascent to the Prasar Bharti Act 1990 by discussing broader and critical issues concerning Indian media. And so we have taken up the discussion on Manipur crisis and the role of media. Now, can I, before we go ahead, can I request all of you please to stand for two minutes in silence for the lives we have lost in Manipur during this terrible time. We have a distinguished panel of speakers with us, and uh, I shall request uh, Vinay Kumar, IIC member, media person, and former associate editor of the Hindu to kindly formally introduce them. Just a minute, Vinay. Uh, so we have uh, Patricia Mukim, editor of Shillong Times who is flown in from Shillong. Sanjoy Hazarika, commentator and author of the Northeast, joins us from Shillong. He'll be joining us online. Pradeep Panjabam, editor of Imphal Review of Arts and Politics, also joins us from Imphal. And Nem Tingai Gate, Associate Professor, Center for Social Medicine and Community Health Jain, is here with us. And so is SN Sahu, columnist and former press secretary to President K.R. Narayanan. Uh, now, uh, Vinay, uh, over to you. And uh, 
Uh, I am yours truly, uh, Suhas Gorkar, who's uh, recently been elected as a trustee of the IIT, who shall moderate the discussion. Over to Vinay. Thank you, Suhas, and uh, welcome, very warm welcome to all of you. Your presence uh, shows the concern which all of us have for Manipur, which over the past five months is engrossed in a vicious cycle of violence. So today's speakers, uh, first we have uh, Patricia Mukhim. She is currently the editor of the Shilong Times, one of Northeast India's oldest English language daily. She is a former member of the National Security Advisory Board and was also on the board of the Indian Institute of Mass Communication. A prolific writer, she uses her columns to educate those outside India's Northeast about its geopolitical pressures and pulls and its ethnic diversities. She has received several journalistic awards, amongst which are the Chameli Devi Jain Award from the Media Foundation. Patricia says she is a journalist activist and sees no conflict of interest there. She was conferred the Padma Shri in the year 2000. On my left is uh, Mr. S. N. Sahu, who is engaged in study, research, and writing on many bold aspects of the freedom struggle with a special focus on the worldviews of Mahatma Gandhi. Jawaharlal Nehru, B. R. Ambedkar, and Swami Vivekananda. He regularly writes on contemporary issues for several newspapers and digital platforms. He served as officer on special duty to President of India, K. R. Narayanan, and had a tenure as director in Prime Minister's office and joint secretary the Raj Sabha Secretariat. We have uh, Pradeep Fanjimam, who will join us online. He's a senior journalist based in Imphal. He began his career in 1986 as a sub-editor with the Economic Times, New Delhi, and is currently the editor of Impal Review of Arts and Politics, a periodical. He is the author of two books, The Northeast Question, Conflicts and Frontiers, written during a two-year residential fellowship at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, and Shadow and Light, a Kaleidoscope of Manipur, done in collaboration with the Indian National Trust for Art and Culture Heritage, Intact, New Delhi. He is also a columnist for the New Indian Express and the Telegraph. Then we have uh, Dr. Guite. She is an associate professor in the Center of Social Medicine and Community Health, School of Social Sciences, JNU, New Delhi. She has also taught in the Department of Social Work, Delhi University, for 11 years prior to joining JNU in 2016. She holds a master's degree in uh, social work and MPhil and PhD in social medicine. She was awarded Fulbright Nehru Postdoctoral Fellowship in Public Health by USIEF and Shastri Mobility Program in Public Health by SICI. Her academic research engagement is on issues concerning indigenous medicinal knowledge for healthcare and economic development in India's Northeast region. And we also have Sanjay Dan, Sanjay Hazarika, uh, who joins us from Shillong online. He combines his roles as a researcher, columnist, mentor, and practitioner. He is an author, journalist, filmmaker, policy analyst, and human rights advocate. A former reporter for the New York Times, Sonja Hazarika founded the Center for Northeast Studies and Policy Research in India, whose flagship program is the innovative feat of board clinics on the Brahmaputra Valley that have reached nearly 3 lakh people every year with healthcare since they began in 2005. He is regarded as an authority on the region and its neighborhood. Between 2016 and 22, he was international director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, which has worked extensively on police and prison reforms, as well as right to information. In 2009, he founded and led the Center for Northeast Studies at Jamia Millia Islamia University, New Delhi. His current work is closely engaged with issues relating to rivers, ecosystems, and communities, as well as climate uncertainty and its impacts on governance and livelihoods. Sanjay Hazarika has scripted and produced over a dozen documentaries, including on the Brahmaputra River and issues about governance and conflict. And uh, Mr. Borkar introduced himself. He's a filmmaker, journalist, activist who founded CFTV four decades ago. And uh, he's a trustee of IIC and associated with uh, a number of concerns which concern the civil society. And uh, again, I will request that if you can keep your mobiles on silent mode, we'll be very grateful over to Swans to moderate the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, now, just to begin, you know, we, we always uh, you know, honor our uh, uh, handloom uh, 
workers and also the pluralism which this country is uh, proud of. So I would uh, be uh, is, the, presenting the, uh, these angavastrams to you know, all the, the speakers here. And uh, first two who cannot join will be sending it to them. So can I, Patricia, can I honor you? Uh, So uh, to begin now, uh, some housekeeping, uh, to some housekeeping, each speaker gets uh, 12 minutes, which takes us past 7.30. This is followed by a Q&A when we close at 8. Uh, the panelists are requested to strictly keep to the time allotted to them, that is 12 minutes. The crisis in Manipur, including alleged acts of uh, sexual violence, extrajudicial killings, forced displacement, torture, and ill treatment and destruction of homes, places of worship, and farmlands posed very serious challenges to the media for accurately reporting the conflict and trauma. Some questions arise out of this. Is the media trained to report conflict? Does the media know enough? Does it have an overall idea of what are the underlying causes or understand the nuances of the deep-seated issues of the conflict? In framing narratives, whose voices are being amplified? In times of ethnic conflict, what is journalistic ethics? Does the media abide by ethical principles in the age of social media and internet based news channels. Does an internet ban during the conflict make matters worse? Does an internet ban favor the advantaged community in providing one-sided reports? Can stories beyond the headlines and hype be mapped? Can a free press promote peace, reconciliation, understanding, and give the much needed healing touch where others have failed? Now, I request uh, Patricia to come on, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in a very critical issue at the moment for us in the region called India's Northeast. Uh, the theme is Manipur crisis, role of the media. My first question is, there is a plethora of media today. You have the instant media, you have the breaking news media. And when I say instant media, I'm thinking of social media with its uh, speed, <laughs> the, the speed at which it travels is phenomenal. Then you have the Godi media. Uh, you that uh, I leave that interpretation to you. I think everyone here in this room knows what the Godi media is. Then we have the traditional or the legacy media, which I am a part of, uh, which still has editors as gatekeepers. So when we are talking media, which media or which medium are we speaking of? And is it possible to bring a sort of a, you know, a level playing field amongst all these media types? Uh, the internet ban in Manipur was not uniformly applied and it seemed to favor one group against another. Reporters had to meet the tyranny of deadlines. They had to write their stories, go to the information and public relations office in Imphal in the valley to send their news across. They had to deal with sources that were often unreliable because it depends who you're talking to and what is the narrative created by that person or persons. Uh, and these unreliable sources ultimately become the basis of our stories. And most of these sources would prefer to remain anonymous. But the crux of the matter is that none of us are trained in conflict reporting. It's a specialized kind of reporting, which cannot be 
you know, accomplished by anyone who's not trained, who's not trained in the ethics of conflict reportage. So we went into Manipur with our hands tied. And despite the presence of the so-called mainstream media, I have a great objection to the word mainstream because I don't know what mainstream you're talking about. I would rather like to refer to different media as national media, regional media, state media, and so on. Uh, despite our presence uh, in this ecosystem, I think social media has greater reach today. And you have hundreds of YouTubers who call themselves content creators. And we they do not adhere to any regulations whatsoever. They have their own way of narrating news. And if they are from the valley, their slant is different. If they are from the hills, they also have a different slant. And then there is an unequal status be between those that have access to the internet and those with no access to the internet. And even today, there's an internet ban going on in Manipur. Uh, these YouTubers, they push their own narratives. And it's unfortunate that sometimes we in the traditional media also look at all these and we try to form our opinions or we try to get our leads from them. And the problem in Manipur today is that both sides of the divide, both parties to the conflict <laughs> want to project themselves as victims. The reality is that the hill tribes are more badly affected due to logistical disadvantages and having no outlet of, out of Manipur except through Mizoram, which is a very long distance, a long haul over very bad roads. and. The, again, the, the problem today is that the people from the hills cannot come down to the valley for anything, including for their education, for their health care, for nothing. So uh, is, there is also this problem of the ignorance of the media, which, which you know, parachutes during these conflict times parachutes to all the states of the Northeast during election and times of conflict, they do not understand the underlying mm -hmm. ethnic tensions in Manipur that date back several decades. Uh, it takes time to internalize the situation, to understand, to comprehend the nuances and to, to understand the root causes of these embedded conflicts which date back to the British time. But Manipur has been experiencing uh, political instability since March this year. We haven't been following all this very well. Uh, these uh, rumblings within the Singh government happened because of the scrapping of the SOO, Suspension of Operation Agreement, which was made since 2008 with the uh, militants in the hills, the Kuki militants. We don't know the reason for scrapping this SOO. Is, is it anything to do with the narco terrorism or the narco trade? Uh, we are not sure about that. And the Armed Forces Special Powers Act was removed from several districts in the valley when the militants in the valley have signed no peace agreement and there are no peace talks between the militants and the government of Manipur or of India. The Armed Forces Special Powers Act was removed from the valley, but it was still invoked in the hills. And at one time, the MLAs of both the hills and the valley wanted a change of face. They wanted to change uh, the Chief Minister Biran Singh. <laughs> And then there is a feeling that perhaps uh, Biran Singh had to do something to, to show that he can control the situation. And I think he started with dislodging settlers from the hill villages on the plea of turning those areas into reserve forests. Uh, I, I tried to check out different media reportage, but I was quite struck by this uh, media, uh, internet media called Muk Nayak. Muk Nayak 
was started in 2019 and it was revived actually in 2019, but it was started by Dr. Ambedkar in 1920. And this media claims to diligently amplify concerns of Dalits, Adivasis, women, minorities, and marginalized. And I think they have done the most extensive reportage if you care to look at them, at their work. And they have reported that there is a lot of stress in the tribal relief camps. People suffered immensely. There were people with cancer. They also visited, they were, they were quite balanced. They also visited the relief camps in the valley. And what they reported was that the inmates there were full of anger. And the anger was directed at the other, of course, who are seen as interlopers, aliens, illegal migrants, any name that you want to choose. Uh, they also reported about the discrimination uh, to tribal students by Manipur University. Out of 76 students who were doing their psychology in a college called Rayburn College, only 10 students passed. After the Indigenous Tribal Leaders Forum complained to the Manipur University, the results were reviewed and they were drastically changed within two to three hours. And the number of students who passed went up from 10 to 41. I think this kind of media reportage gives us some idea of the holistic situation in that state. In a, in a subject which is called the modern Indian language, where we generally write in our own language, some students from the hills got zero. So the ITLF, the Indigenous Tribal Leaders Forum, has asked the UGC to investigate and do a comprehensive audit and to transfer all the tribal students to other reputed state universities. Then Mook Nayat also reported the repeated looting of weapons as late as in the month of August from the Indian Reserved Battalion in Vishnupur. Uh, a lot of the media reported only the looting of weapons the first time that was in on the 4th of May. They also gave a very detailed reportage of how people came in 45 vehicles, stole 22,000 bullets and 5,000 weapons from 35 police stations. Sometimes you wonder where is the law and where is the order. But I think the worst reportage from us, the media, is when we reported what Tushar Mehta, the Solicitor General of India, told the Supreme Court. He said that the bodies lying unclaimed at the morgues are those of infiltrators. I think we in the media should have accosted him and asked him, how does he know this? How does he identify a dead person to be an illegal migrant or uh, an indigenous citizen of Manipur. And how could the Solicitor General use just the government source? And why should a Solicitor General report a state narrative before the highest judiciary? These are questions we didn't ask. Claims of illegal migrants adding to the hill population is also misplaced. Uh, that, you know, there is a huge population outburst in the hills. We can't say anything because we do not have a comparative census. There was no census uh, in 2021. The last census was in 2011. We also forgot to report stories of the MLA who was tortured, and he was the CM's advisor, Mr. Valte. He was nearly killed and now he is recouping, but I think has turned into a vegetable. We are not following up on these cases. You know, we make a one-off report and then we forget about following up on our stories. I think this is, this is a media sin. There are many internal clashes between supporters of the Hill MLAs, which led to the burning of a gym supposed to be inaugurated by Biran Singh sometime in April. Uh, this, you know, all these, this anger was commenting uh, in the hills, but later on, 
it took, I, we don't know the turn of events that turned it into an ethnic conflict. Perhaps the ethnic conflict was, as, as media reported, uh, the eviction of settlements in reserved areas like the Songjiang village. But whatever be the reason, uh, most of us felt that the, uh, the High Court directive to the Manipur government saying that the ST status of the Metes should be decided by July 4th or something to that effect. We thought that that was the main reason. I, I don't think that a proper analysis would show that that was the main reason. There are many, many, many reasons. One of them, as we all know, is uh, that there have been no land reforms in Manipur, which continues today uh, in, in, in the form of 53% of the Mete people being restricted to an area of only 1% of the geographical um, uh, area of Manipur. 90% of the geographical area is, is inhabited by about 43% of the people. So that is a bone of contention and uh, attempts to bring in land reforms have not succeeded. As a result, the hills are not within the revenue department of the state. So those people living in the hills, if they do want to uh, take a loan from any bank and not offer their land as collateral because land is not uh, under the revenue department. And uh, there has been no, uh, what should I say, the cadastral survey. When you do a cadastral survey, you know exactly how much land a state has. Without a cadastral survey, you do not know that. All these claims about Manipur being so many, so many square kilometers of land are just claims. Unless you do a cadastral survey, you'll not know how much land is owned by people in the hills and in the valley. In the hills, you have a different land tenure system where land belongs to the chieftain. And the chieftain decides who to give land to. So when we say that uh, perhaps the, the hills erupted when they heard that the maintenance were going to be given ST status and that they would also be able to buy land in the hills. I think we're forgetting that without any land reforms, even an ST status member cannot just buy land in areas dominated by Kukis and Nagas. Each of them have their own traditional um, land revenue system. Not, I will not use the word revenue because you know it's a traditional land holding system. The video of those two women who were paraded naked, I think that was the snapshot of the moment that caught world attention. And just as well, because otherwise we would have been reporting Manipur very normally. So many people died today, so many bombs were thrown at so many houses, and it doesn't seem to shake the conscience of the nation as much as the video of those two women who were paraded naked. Then there was this instance of beheading and dismembering the body of a young man called David Tay. He was a village volunteer. He was also a good footballer. The way that his body was dismembered is cruelty of the highest order. And sometimes you wonder how people can be so cruel. So most of the media did not really narrate the narrative as it should be, because this should cause, I mean, this should shake the conscience of the nation. Then very recently, you have the killing of uh, a noted singer and lyricist. He was killed along with four other volunteers. And the reason he died was because he couldn't get immediate medical help, because he was taken all the way through Mizoram, and he died on the way. Now, but the worst part is, I think, the silence of the media vis-a-vis -vis reporting what the prime minister of the country has to say about the conflict. There's not a single media, I mean, Delhi-based media person who dared to ask the prime minister any question on Manipur. Even today, there's nobody to ask him why he has not visited a state where there's been conflict for five months. It's a state that is also 
you know, they, they understand the role of the media, which is why on the 100th episode of Man Ki Baat, the people of Manipur threw away their transistors. They refused to listen. So have we in the media lost the plot vis-a-vis -vis Manipur because we do not dare question the very people who could have controlled it? They could have imposed 356 president's rule. They said they would impose 355, which is uh, giving the powers, you know, the, 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 the meaning that uh, security would be in the hands of the central government. That didn't happen. Mr. Biran Singh, the chief minister of Manipur, is still controlling the law and order there. And if you listen to people from the central security forces, they are saying we can't do anything much. There are about 40,000 people there in uniform, but the conflict continues and there's nothing much that anyone can do. So we need to do a conflict assessment to understand who the parties in conflict are, what role are they playing in the situation? Are the media persons from the respective conflicting communities able to report objectively? To my mind, no, they, they cannot. They've lost that objectivity. And uh, each side claims different facts and they will always, you know, in their view, the opposing side's facts are always false. And uh, I think as media persons, we really need to train ourselves on ethical conflict reportage so that we do not escalate the conflicts. Because what we've seen here is that media persons from both parties in the conflict became <laughs> narrative creators that saw themselves as victims and the other side as perpetrators. Thank you very much. I think later we can answer questions. Uh, thank you very much, Patricia, uh, uh, for that kind of overview of, uh, and uh, then of course, you emphasized the training, but you started with that and ended with it uh, the, for ethical uh, reportage of uh, conflict situations. Uh, and then, of course, you mentioned about the silence of the media, <clears throat> not asking the man who's uh, supposed to be running the country anything. Anyway, so we'll uh, now go over to Sanjoy. Uh, Sanjoy, are you there? Yeah, yeah. I'm here. Can you hear yeah, me? Please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Suhas, and I'd like to thank the IIC and uh, uh, all my fellow panelists uh, and uh, friends who've come to listen and I hope to learn from all of you. Um, the Northeast has always been a bit of a place where reporters from across the country and the world have parachute and usually parachute in uh, for, to hit the ground running and get a story. Uh, but that, uh, and that is not just true of Manipur, it's true of many parts of, of, of the region. Um, and as uh, Patricia has so uh, eloquently and in great detail pointed out, uh, there are many complexities uh, which uh, can be both confusing, frustrating, and extremely challenging. Uh, I'd like to just look at the whole, because I don't want to go into the uh, genesis of the problem or what's in store or whatever, but I want to look at some of the issues that have come up, part of which, uh, part of these Patricia referred to, she talked about conflict reporting, and uh, the need uh, for training. Now, this is something that many of us have been emphasizing, not just for <clears throat> the region we call the Northeast, but also for uh, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, for uh, in any other part where there are conflicts in our country, or have been conflicts in our country. But the problem is that 
if you want a journalist to go into a situation of conflict, he, he must be insured. Most journalists are not insured by their employers. And in these days, in these times when uh, media organizations are strapped for funds, you can bet your boots that that is not a priority. You have a situation in, certainly in our country and in many countries across the world where uh, the media is driven not by field reportage, and this has been the case for some time, but by studio discussions and anchor-driven uh, perceptions. And, uh, but there are many sort of print, offline, and online journalists who, are, uh, who take risks and have done so also in the case of Manipur. Um, I want to look at uh, a couple of issues here. And uh, Suhas, please uh, give me a, 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 a note when I am uh, at 10 minutes, because there are several points I want to cover. One is that um, in, in Manipur, that we're talking, since we're talking specifically about Manipur, to report freely and fairly is a near impossibility. Now, I speak as somebody who has been to Manipur in the past. I haven't been this time, partly because I feel I need to go in a time when things are, uh, you're accessible and you have access to people at all times who you want. So one of the first things of reporting a situation as, uh, uh, on the ground is that you must have the confidence to go everywhere and anywhere and be able to talk to anyone. Now, clearly that is not possible, certainly in, in Manipur for journalists who are based in one side or the other, and even for those who come in from, from outside. Um, and when we talk about the media, uh, it's um, it's not what we call the mainstream media. We have only metro medias for the large part, city driven, uh, focused on what uh, is of importance to their main readership, which may not be what uh, interests people in our part of the world, in other parts of the country. So media, what is media? Media is basically people like us. We bring to it our own interests, our own prejudices, our own quirks, and uh, at least some of us don't try and bring that into our reporting. But it's there. And um, I think as far as Manipur is concerned, some of the media has reported this basic fact that the issues around Manipur remain at the heart issues, contestations over land and resources. However, your, whatever your perspective, that's where it essentially comes from. And that has played out in the media in different ways. Now, we are speaking here, I'd like uh, uh, one of the pan two of our panelists who are from Manipur. I cannot speak or write uh, Manipuri, but I down straight. Uh, I can only follow what's there in the English script. So our understanding of what is uh, going on there is often limited by what we see and what we read and the people we talk to. So this is why the ban on the internet, which uh, Patricia referred to, has had a devastating effect on reporting. Uh, and uh, for a long time, even normal calls were not possible. Uh, and in such a situation, you the agenda or the reporting is driven by social media. So if, say, in the 2000s, when the phrase citizen journalist was very, uh, was very popular, today you have the uh, netizen, uh, journalists. 
And uh, although there is some value in this, I don't think that you can have a situation where people essentially report whatever they think or what they hear at second or third hand, occasionally what they see themselves. Uh, that cannot be the what drives uh, the media or media agenda. Um, now, that having been said, uh, I think that there is a great deal um, which revolves around the question of sensitivities. And, uh, we have seen how those have played out in Manipur, both in the media and its reflection in uh, societal uh, concerns and issues. So we need, above all, in situations of conflict, like Manipur and other places, you need an abundance of fact-checking. Fact-checkers are uh, an endangered species, whether it's here or anywhere else. But their numbers need to multiply. You need much more of that. Uh, to happen if you're going to get a, some sort of balanced reporting. Now, what's been pointed out so far, and I think Patricia made this point very clear, is that from the hills, you get a very different narrative of everything. And from the valley, you get a very different narrative of everything. Perceptions are different. And the reality, the perceived lived realities are also very different. But then I always think about this, you know, in a situation where there is so much uh, disturbance and lack of access, what can journalists do? You pick up the phone and talk to each other. Now, even that has not been happening because if you don't have access to the net, you don't have access to, journal to officials because they're also scared and they don't want to talk openly or can't go to their offices for whatever reason. They're not interested in talking. There is nothing that can stop journalists from talking to each other, media from talking to each other, editors from talking to each other, not just in one area, but in others. Now, I think that hasn't really happened, uh, but I, I hope that will begin to happen. Because unless you know what the other side is thinking and experiencing, we won't be able to uh, actually uh, give a full picture of or uh, understand the, the larger picture of what's going on. Now, we have seen um, a lot of uh, some reports which have come out uh, and some of the reports have become uh, the news rather than anything else, especially the Editors Guild of India uh, report. But there have been four reports so far. One was, of course, by the uh, by women's two by women's groups which went. One got slapped with sedition. The other one was mostly uh, reporting from the field and was uh, what is very descriptive uh, rather than analytical. Uh, very good. It helped us understand, but the Editors Guild uh, report, which triggered has triggered a lot of controversy. I have just uh, one, one or two questions about it. One is that we've read the report. I don't see a question. What's the question? What are the questions that are asked? The same questions asked from different people. We ask different questions of different people. I think that's very important. To, to understand that. I don't particularly care if they were asked also by the army to do it or not. It's a report. It's there. We may agree with it. We are completely disagree with it. And I think many people disagree with it. But I would like to know what is the professional structure of doing such a report? Because you cannot have journalists and editors writing like activists. There's a separate way of approaching this issue. Now, I know the uh, people who went, and I respect them, but I think that this is something that we do need to, to look at. Um, I think that uh, 
I know that our, our Manipuri colleagues and friends have uh, a lot to say. I will close with um, a couple of points. One is that uh, apart from the issue of um, reporting and the gaps in gaps in reporting, we also need to look at uh, where journalists, whether it's from within the state or outside the state, have highlighted not just good practices, but uh, things which have happened. Because good news is also news. It's not as if everything is, is terrible. Now, that may sound a bit naive and in, in this context, but I believe that it is important that we, we, we look also at that. Um, because, you know, whether peace, reconciliation, dialogue, all these things are distant. But the media needs to also look at issues which uh, can uh, perhaps drive uh, processes of change. At least everybody seeks peace and calm and security. Uh, we have not seen any uh, reporting of, uh, uh, we've seen some reporting at least, uh, of the uh, trauma that people continue to suffer who are in camps and out of relief camps. You know, I'm talking about uh, PTSD and PTSD, post-trauma stress disorder and uh, syndrome. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we look at that and, and try and understand that and write about it and report about it much more. Uh, and I think one of the first things that uh, must be restored fully is the, is the internet because, uh, you know, there have been enough studies which have, uh, which have shown that an internet shutdown that's not really improved conditions. It probably just worsens them. Uh, so I would like to close here, Suhas, and I'd like to thank all of you for this opportunity. Uh, uh, thanks. To share, uh, share my yeah, thoughts. thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, you've highlighted certain points, uh, and that I think the most important point which you've highlighted is uh, the the you know we don't have any proper fact checkers, uh, and there's all uh, I mean some. Uh, some of these uh, we we don't we can't check at all. Uh, now, uh, can I ask uh, Pradeep to join, please? Pradeep. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> let me just time the like twelve minutes I have. So uh, let me uh, begin. I I have some notes, but before I start on that, let me just. Uh, uh, speak from some of the notes I made during during the presentation of the earlier speakers because there were some new points raised and I want to also comment on them and of course also the keynote speaker he has also raised the issue well and also the thing that I was I was most uh, happy with is that everybody is agreeing how difficult it is to actually represent trauma and and conflict it's always it's not just in the case of Manipur, we've seen it in, say, for instance, Ukraine. You don't know who's right and wrong. It depends on where you, you look at the problem from. So that kind of thing is always going to be there. And there are also some very basic issues that you have to be aware of. And so many people have written about before. And uh, one of them is also has also been raised here. And I want to also bring it up again. The idea of the, the silence. Uh, is it necessary for people to be silent? sometimes that that idea of self-censorship no i would uh, give reference to say Henrik ibsen for instance his his place where he was talking about the white line that sometimes you lie to save you know, he's not just uh, lying to deceive people but sometimes you lie to save you know, for instance if i were, went to the doctor and the doctor diagnosed that i had i mean uh, cancer i mean severe cancer last stage and when i asked the doctor doctor how, how is my health and if he tells me that you're going to die within two weeks, he's telling me the truth, but that truth is not very, very helpful, or maybe it's cruel even. 
So he may try, try to tell, tell me a lie that you're okay, you'll be saved. I mean, you, there are medicines, do it. Oh, what, what kind of explanation he gives, I don't know, but then he may not be telling me the truth. But that truth is actually that lie is actually meant as a message, as, as a communication of goodwill. So I think these things come up when you're when you're talking about uh, conflict coverage, when it's uh, talking about trauma coverage. And, and again, some of the issues and some of the uh, pictures that you see are, or you know, so some of the victims, they may not be able to claim some of the experiences they had because it's so traumatic. Sometimes it's so shameful. Sometimes it's so, so, so self-demeaning. And sometimes it's so fearful for them. So, so they just they shut off. And here again, there are people who have written so much about this. As for, as for instance, Kathy Carroth in, in, in her book, uh, Unclaimed Experiences, and her analysis of, of, of uh, the Hiroshima, where the, the movie Hiroshima Mon Amor, is actually classic in this. You know, that, that, that some experiences you don't claim. And because you don't claim, that actually gives a bigger, bigger picture of that, uh, of, of that uh, thing that happened. As for instance, in Hiroshima, you, there was the, I just give it quickly because I don't have much time. I just quickly give you one, one, one scene from there that this is about a French woman who had a very bad experience during the Second World War. She fell in love with a German woman and uh, a German, German soldier. And when in France, in a, in a village called Nevers, where you know, the Allied came and took over and her lover was killed and she was excommunicated, tortured, shamed, and all that. And she had a very terrible experience. But and some years later, when the Hiroshima thing happened, she identified her own trauma with the trauma those uh, those those in Hiroshima would be facing. And she comes there. She has a, had an occasion to come there, and there she falls in love with a Japanese man. And they start telling stories of each other. And the Japanese man also had his own uh, experience, very very traumatic experience. She was she was in in South Asia fighting war, probably in Manipur or somewhere. <laughs> When the, when the bomb was dropped, so he didn't die, but he was still, there was a, there was a point uh, where this uh, woman goes out to see the Hiroshima Museum, comes back, and the Japanese man asks her, what have you seen? And she says, I've seen everything, so traumatic. And then this man gets angry. You know, How can you say you've seen everything? You're not from here. You don't know what uh, losses I, I went through. I lost my house. I lost a favorite street that I was walking on as a, as a, as a, as a, as a young man. I lost my family. You will never see that trauma again. And the, and the question that Kathy Carroll asked is that you know, the Japanese man, he's also not, not an actual person who experienced that trauma because he was away from, from, from Japan at the time. If he was there in Hiroshima, he would have been dead. So whose history is history is, is, is a question that Kathy Carroll asked. Is, is the French woman's history of Hiroshima history or is only the history told by of a history of Hiroshima told by the Japanese man, history of Hiroshima, which one is more truthful? That's the kind of question that was asked. And the answer probably is somewhere in between. And this again has been discussed by so many other scholars that you know you have people who are subject to that particular problem and they are narrating their own problems, the, the, the experience that they had. Is that, more, is that a more, uh, is that a truer history of that particular event? Or is it also somebody who's coming from outside, empathizing with that place and writing about that place? Or, or you know, to, to bring that same analogy again, is the Japanese woman's, I mean, the French woman's history of uh, Japan, uh, Hiroshima more truthful, or is it a Japanese man? That kind of question always comes about. And so I think the idea of, uh, the, uh, of, of silence, the idea of covering the truthful reportage of a traumatic event, these are very, very problematic issues. So I don't think it is correct for us to actually Think in linear terms that you know two plus two is equal to four. That kind of simple equation is not always say that it can be a simultaneous equation. You can have two answers for the same equation, or if it's, if it is a quadratic equation, you can have multiple answers for the same equation. So those kind of things, I think we have to be aware of. But uh, I, th I think uh, ultimately, let me come back to the situation in Manipur, and I am glad we began with a two-minute silence today. And even today, there was a there was a violent incident. Three people were killed. And different reporters, depending on who which side is reporting, uh, whether they were terrorists or whether they were, they were villagers, that kind of thing will always happen. So I don't think it is right for us to actually make immediate judgment. I think the best thing.
That will be lost it up. I, I think that the red right. print on it Okay, so a very warm welcome and good evening to all of us present here today. And thank you so much for taking out your time uh, to discuss a very uh, sensitive uh, and at the same time a very critical issue which Manipur is uh, going, I mean, undergoing for the past four months. So the violence are still continuing. And uh, we are here uh, today to debate on the role of media in uh, understanding Manipur crisis. And I would say since from the beginning, it is the media which has informed us what is uh, going on over there for people who are sitting here in Delhi and uh, and we like academicians like us interact and uh, talk about and do our own expert analysis uh, sitting in the comfort of our home and in our workplace. But the reality at the ground level uh, is more than what we uh, could uh, perceive. And uh, before I begin, as uh, our imminent uh, <laughs> presence would like to know more about myself, I am uh, named Tian Ngai Guite, and I belong to the Paite tribe, uh, which uh, comes under the umbrella of the Kukizo in Manipur. And presently, I am teaching in uh, JNU. And uh, I am not a media expert. My uh, disciplinary background is in social work and in public health. But it is my commitment to the cause of my people at this time of crisis that brings me here today uh, to speak uh, in front of all the luminaries present here today. So please uh, don't treat me as a media expert, but I would like to speak from what I have, uh, my experience with the media in this entire crisis. I would like to flag uh, the few points where uh, I feel that uh, the whole uh, narratives of uh, when we talk about the dominant and the minorities, or let's say the majority and the minority narratives. So I would just want to flag uh, points on uh, media and the partisan role which media has played uh, in terms of projecting uh, the uh, minority cookies or group as let's say illegal immigrants from Myanmar and poppy cultivators or narcotic uh, traders. So those kind of uh, narrative which has come through this uh, conflict. This is one point which I want to flag. Maybe I'll go in detail again, uh, if time permits. Then the journalistic ethics, which we're talking about the bias reporting and then uh, the recent reports which has come out uh, by the editor guilds of India and then how they have been, uh, you see the rebuttal and all those things. And then also the roles of social and cultural group in influencing how the media reports should be done. And uh, another point is on internet ban, uh, the social media and uh, fake news. Uh, before that, I just want to uh, say from my own experience, like when this violence has started on 3rd May, I have my uh, relatives in Imphal, and I have uh, my relatives, my cousin who is working there in Manipur government. And, you know, on the 6th, I received a call saying that, you know, uh, uh, you have to book a ticket for the I am here with my two uh, daughters, her daughter, one is four months old and one is three years old. And they were in a CRPF camp and it was so shocking for me. It was so sudden, like, what has happened because 
okay, we follow the uh, reporting and all, but sometimes we tend to, uh, if you are not very much uh, politically oriented, like I would say, I have never uh, engaged myself with identity politics or diversity politics in my entire career, even though I work in the field of uh, development, healthcare, and issues which are concerning like social exclusion, discrimination, and how health it has impact on our uh, health outcome. It, it can be both mental well-being and physical well-being. So it was so shocking. And uh, what I get from the media reports and what mm -hmm. I talk to them every day, the ground reality, even till today, I call up my mother and my other relatives every day to know what is going on and what reports which I receive. So uh, that's one which, uh, I mean, kind of uh, made me the conviction to, you know, if you are here in the in the capital of India and if you become the voice of the voiceless. So that commitment has bring me here today. And uh, OK, now coming to my first point, when I want to highlight uh, flag the issue of media and the partisan roles of the media in uh, uh, projecting the uh, minorities, the cookies of minorities, sorry, all my pages are. <laughs> so I would say when it comes to framing the narratives during the entire violence, um, the Manipur print and digital media plays a very important role in amplifying the voices of the uh, Meite ethnic community. It is observed that Manipur media houses have become uh, Meite media. And they were partisan in deepening the divide and displays their ethnic loyalties. So if you see the type of media which is existing in Manipur, they are in the form of like news print, which is digital. You have online broadcasts and radio. The radio is not functioning since the violence has erupted and the vernacular reportings because nobody can go to the radio station and do those reporting in the vernacular dialects and also the, and then on the other hand, you see the Manipur media is largely owned by the daily based media, which is both English and Meitei. So you have uh, media houses like the Sangai Express, the EPAO, the Infal Times, Infal Free Press, and the People's Chronicle. So they are all daily based and except for few, which are heel based. And one distinctive concern which I have raised was the projection and stereotyping of the cookies of tribes as illegal immigrants from Myanmar and also poppy cultivators, narcotic terrorists, and a threat to national security. security. And the second concern is the projection of the crisis based on religion, particularly at the national and the international platforms. And the other, the third concern is the engagement of the media in publishing reporting fake news or fake press releases and false propaganda. And it is seen rampant and the damage can be seen persisting till today. And when we talk about the uh, uh, mainstream media or the national media, initially when the violence broke out, there was a meme uh, doing around in social media, which says that there's a, uh, the media reporters wanted to go to Imphal, they end up in Gohati and they ask where is Imphal and then they, uh, they land in Timapur and you know, something like that, which just kind of humorously highlighting how Manipur is, uh, uh, I mean, to most, it's unknown and then the diversity, the population composition, and how endemic it is to ethnic violence. And in the past, uh, and I'm not a historian, but in the past, uh, there are ethnic violence which has been witnessed. As a child, I have also witnessed when I was in school. So those uh, violence, uh, it's been very endemic. So we see violence uh, um, happening. And then at this juncture, in sometimes some of the media experts or some of the academia, try to normalize that, oh, it's okay. I mean, this is happening between the cookie and the Naga, the cookie and the Paite, the cookie and this, that. And uh, it's a normal thing in uh, Manipur. So normalization of such kinds of violence to me is uh, highly unacceptable. And I have a strong objection to it, even though there has been differences in terms of uh, the historical past, uh, no consensus on uh, whose land belong to whom, but the magnitude of violence is and not acceptable and the kind of oppression and 
uh, violence that has been inflicted on the uh, cookies of minorities is something which is a, uh, I mean, grave concern. And you see a serious humanitarian crisis in this whole episode. And it is, again, the media which is uh, highlighting both uh, the real news, uh, the real, the real, the fact, and the facts. And uh, now, again, I want to highlight of the uh, regarding the uh, fake news, which, uh, no, before the fake news, I just have this point when it comes to uh, the ethics, journalistic ethics that we're talking about. So you see that uh, the media coverage is seen to be so unethical. That's why you have the headquarter three corps letter of army to the EGI and acting on that letter received from the army headquarters, the EGI issued a statement on 14 July, 2023 that it has been watching and reading with great concern, I'm quoting them, of the Manipur uh, violence by section of the media, including the local, regional and national. So, they said it is a matter of regret that instead of objective and fact-finding reporting, there is a noticeable bias in the coverage that is contributing to the divisiveness and violence. So Abhi, recently there was this letter which has gone viral and the letter was uh, talking about uh, and mentioning that what exactly happened and what was the report, uh, the newspaper report was saying. So uh, it may be here at this point, again, it may be relevant to mention the role of social and cultural groups in influencing the media to go against the ethics of journalism. So one such instance at the initial days of the violence is the case of uh, journalist Afrida Hussein from India Today. She was first and only journalist to report a gunfight between the Métis militants and the 37 Assam rifles in Suknu area. So the Métis militants here, the Arambai Tengol terror outfits, include surrender valley-based insurgent groups. And in an attempt to intimidate her and force her to retract the article, the supporters of uh, Métis terrorism gathered outside her hotel in Imphal with the malicious intent to cause her harm. So she was finally rescued by the Assam rifles. She wrote an account of this letter, ending with the remark, those threatening phone calls, however, continue to haunt me, raising several questions in my mind. Aren't we supposed to bring out the truth? No one questioned me when I went to Manipur on 5th May and covered cookie militants. But one thing against the majority community got me into trouble. This is one instance. And another instance was a really based new news media, which is called Mami TV. In a moment of honesty, they reported that tribal villages were attacked and torched by Meite radical groups. And the militant sympathizers in Imphal forced the news media to apologize and issue a charizendum to replace uh, to replace the statement which they had issued. So the fresh Mete radical groups, they wanted to re replace the fresh Mete radical groups with Mete village guard. So this is second instant. Another instant which I want to highlight is the role of the Mera Pairis, which is a strong uh, social pressure groups of women who decide everything from reporting and decisions of the media. The, you see that during this entire, even the latest violence was between them. I mean, they have been opposing the uh, Indian army, the forces to carry out their work. And they have been playing a very pertinent role in protecting the, the military militants to you know, carry out attack on those cookie villages. And the third point that, which I want to flag is an internet ban during the conflict. I mean, it to me, it makes matter worse and reports do say that. And uh, the purpose of uh, banning the internet was that 
to uh, you know to thwart the design and activities of anti-national and anti-social elements by stopping the disinformation and false rumor through various social media platforms such as WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc., on mobile phone. And uh, the broadband services were also banned. So the communication blockage by the government also had a deleterious effect on journalism as it directly impacted the ability of journalists to communicate with each other, their editors and their sources. So it also affected the media because local news which were gathered without any communication link was not sufficient to give a balanced view of the situation. And often even that was not enough to fill their pages or meet their news requirement. So with the uh, internet suspended and communication and transport in this way, uh, the media had to rely entirely on the narrative of the state government. So this narrative under the present uh, chief minister, dispensation became a very narrow ethnic one playing up to the biases of the majority Meiji community. Lastly, I want to come to fake news. Am I uh, exit my turn? Yeah. So see, you see in this entire political uh, tension and violence on the ground, one factor that stood out alarmingly is the amount of misinformation and fabricated propaganda, which I myself also sometimes struggling, like which one is right, which one is wrong, which one is fact, which one is uh, facts. So, uh, here comes the role of uh, social media, which play the most vital role in the spread of violence. Uh, although the tribal minorities are able to raise their voices through social media, but leaving apart the few incidents like the viral video of a woman being uh, raped and paraded naked, no significant impact was visible. On the other hand, social media has become a tool to spread misinformation and fact narratives against uh, minority cookies of me community, and there is no check on that. So, uh, and also due to social media, a big chunk of people in mainland India have formed the opinion against the cookies of people and are seeing this conflict as a war on uh, Meiji Hindu by the Christian missionaries and then the narratives of, you know, drug peddling, illegation, illegal immigration. So all those are generated by the social media. So now, uh, I mean, it is believed like beyond doubt that fake news incited Manipur violence. And uh, it has, it is deeply unsettling also that we see that uh, it's because of the fake news that uh, those two women who were paraded naked, molested and sexually assaulted and over a piece of fake news. It all began with a picture, the photograph of a body which is wrapped in plastic, a young woman lying next to a suitcase. This photograph went viral in Manipur along with its, it was a message saying that it is a Meite woman who was raped and killed by cookie men. This is what the viral video uh, said. And it was it was a lie. The victim name is actually Ayushi Chaudhary, and this was this picture was uh, of uh, last year, which was happening in uh, Delhi, and uh, it's a case of murder which was happening in Delhi. So on the third May is when the clash broke out in the state, and the photo went viral. And uh, report says that the local police did try to stop the rumors from spreading. They did it call fake news, but the photo reached more people than the pol police advisory did. So the fake news spread like wildfire. wildfire. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I just want to pose this uh, question in when it comes to fake news and the um, ethics uh, uh, of uh, media. Mm, sorry for my this oh uh, yeah so uh the question is like this kind of uh, fake news can be it uh, the so at the age of social media and internet it can be a double edged sword without social media the horror of manipur may not have come to life had this video not been shared had it not spread online, the story would have remained suppressed. 
But the same internet platforms also help in inciting the mob. They fail to curb the fake news. They fail to act when they should have. And this is, I mean, a long list of failures, which is not limited to Manipur only. Uh, like fi uh, five years uh, later, similar, similar I mean, there was this similar incidents in the neighboring Myanmar genocide a few years back was reported. United Nations also found Facebook guilty of spreading lies. So this was, all this was in 2018. And now five years later, similar events are unfolding in Manipur. So it raises some very serious questions. How can responsibility be fixed? Where should the line be drawn? And more importantly, who should draw that line? What can remain on the internet and for how long? Who should decide that, the government or the platforms? So I'm afraid there are no clear rules, but the current system is not working, uh, that is for sure. That's why we see this magnitude of violence and self-regulation has failed. So today, uh, the government of India had to step in. It asked Twitter to take down the Manipur video. It issued warnings to other platforms as well. It said this video should be removed because it could incite more violence. So the immediate priority, of course, is to control the situation. But the larger questions on the perils of fake news and how it can be controlled should also be addressed, addressed sooner than later. So maybe our gathering may help us in addressing some of these pertinent questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Now, uh, can we go back to Pradeep? Is he there? Uh, yeah, thank you. My yeah. internet Sorry, connection uh, went off. Yeah. Your line broke off. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think I had about five minutes left when I, I think when the internet was yeah, cut off. Yeah, I didn't know it was yeah. cut off, so I was talking for another two minutes before my daughter told me that the, 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 the internet is off. So now it's back. So let me just uh, uh, take off from where I left off and also to uh, some new ideas have come in. So let me just touch on them. And summarize. Now, one thing that I was saying, I don't know if I said it, whether you heard it, because I was speaking for a long time, as I said, when the internet went off. So I was talking about not thinking on just on linear lines or, or, or on two-dimensional kind of a vision that we have is, is always very dangerous for summarizing what conflict is. So you have you can have an equation which is quite simple, a linear equation where you know two plus two is equal to four, but you can also have simultaneous equations where you can have Two answers for the same 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 equation or quadratic equation where you have more answers so i think life is like that that is is, is uh, multi-dimensional and I, and as i was saying in the beginning and i was taking the example of the hiroshima monomore movie which was analyzed by kathy Carroll, and the movie is by ellen renais uh, uh, the french filmmaker famous fr french filmmaker and i could see that in, the, in even in the last speaker's account that my account is more truthful than yours and and the, that kind of thing the participant and the objective observer that kind of thing. And I, I think I, do, I will not go too much into that. Uh, that is actually, you know, even in, in the scholastic circle, this is something which is not totally decided. What is actually the truth of a very traumatic situation? There's these kind of things. I think the, the, these will need a lot more discussion. But let me just go back to, because you know, so much has been referred to the EGI report and all that. And here, you know, I want to just uh, highlight one thing. In journalism, when we are learning journalism, there are two things that we that are thought to be or, or taught, we were taught to be uh, the thought are actually is, are very important inalienable one is that you know facts are sacred you can't change facts and and opinions are free you can have opinions you can you can have you i may not like somebody i can tell tell that person that i don't like her or him but i can't say something which is not true that that is one of the first dictums of journalism and i think the eji report actually crossed this line that you are I are allowed to give opinion. You're allowed to say you don't like certain things. You don't like, uh, uh, or you think certain things should not have happened. Those kind of things you can say, but you can't say something which is not true at all. As for instance, on in the in, on the question of forest, they did that. That uh, uh, the governors were at whim declaring the reserve forest and protected forest. And the fact is that in Manipur, the last reserve forest was declared in 1990. This was the Manumaji. This is quite close to my house, Manumaji Hill. And the last protected forest was declared in 1978. So that's a long time ago. And then there's no new reserve forest. And just to clarify on the question of uh, eviction, 
uh, there are is it's all communities you know and and I have seen that because I'm also involved in the forest project so I know a bit of the of the details there that uh, from 1915 onwards 1915 October onwards till, till March of 2023 uh, uh, there were evictions eviction drives and in that the most number of uh, villages were not actually cookies the cookies only 59 villages were evicted and Metis 143 villages were evicted and Meti Pangal, these are Meti Muslims, they have 137. Nagas had 138 villages. Nepalese had, had 36 villages and all that. So it's, it's not actually targeted at one community. And the idea of eviction also came about because you know, there are some flaws in the... Because I, as I said, I, I was, I'm involved in a forestry project. So uh, the uh, protected forests are different from reserve forests in a sense that in the protected forests, those villages which are already existing can, can, can continue to be there. In a reserve forest, it can't be, but in a protected forest, it can be. But what happened was some officers made the mistake or deliberate or otherwise that I, I don't want to know, or I don't want to tell uh, what I think, but uh, they gave what is known as, you know, the, the uh, uh, exclude, they excluded these villages, I mean, setting aside, they, they, in their term, it's called setting aside. In the reserve forest, for instance, if you have a declared a reserve forest, and there are villages around that reserve forest. In, in, inside, there cannot be any. The reserve forest will be declared only where there are no villages at all. But if there are villages outside of that reserve forest claiming some land of their land has have, have been uh, covered by the reserve forest, then that will be set aside. After studying, that will be set aside. But in the case of, of the protected forest, the, the villages can remain inside the village and they don't have to be set aside. But some officers did started doing that, setting aside. And also the number of villages increased many falls. And, and the particular village that somebody mentioned, uh, because somebody mentioned that Kesonjang village, that's in the Chochanpur Khopum uh, protected forest. And there were 38 villages when this was, this was declared in 1966. And now there are 191 villages. And these, all these villages are set aside, which is not uh, in the law, that you're not supposed to set aside villages within protected forest. And the set aside villages actually became more than the area of the forest, which is about 497 square kilometers. It's a big forest. And uh, the total area of the set aside villages became more than that. So they have had to do something about this. They had to bring it within uh, the, uh, they had to enumerate this. So that was the thing. And the eviction process had, had begun. And there was one village, Kesonjang, which was evicted, which was not there two years ago, but it, it became a village. It had 15 houses. And 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 again, in that amongst those fifteen houses, there were four metis houses as well. It's not just cookies; probably there were carpenters and and farmers or whatever. They they uh, also were there in, in in that village. So I think uh, we should not be looking at that. And the uh, before I digress too much, let me just go to the second point of journalism. One was that facts are sacred, opinions are free, and that is often not observed by many journalists. And the second thing is, and I think it's also equally important, is that. When in doubt, leave it out. And you know, there's some people who are, are not very sure of data, but then they just use it. When they have to keep keep, uh, keep their deadline for, for filing their report, and they have to justify their uh, investigation. And they, they, they would have told their editor or whoever that they, they'll be doing this. They, maybe there'll be money spent to, to send him or her to a certain point. They have to justify that expenditure. They have to justify that assignment. So this is right without actually being sure of what, what, what is there. And that can happen to, as some, uh, so many have said before, the the uh, the, uh, the parachute journalists, uh, as we know them now, I don't know uh, for, for, for uh, the lack of a better term. Those, those kind of things also happen. You're not very sure about things, but you imagine things, uh, you connect the dots without actually knowing how to connect them and then, and then just make up a story and send it. Those kind of things can also happen. So these are the things that we have to be always on the lookout for. And this sometimes, and in fact, I would say very often is not kept in both, both these principles, especially nowadays, especially with the coming in of the social media, with the internet media, when you have to be instant, you know, you're know, you not chasing a deadline. I mean, newspaper deadlines are short. You write a story and then it at least lasts till uh, till about 12 o'clock in the evening where you, where you file it and when that is published. But in the case of uh, say internet, you, it has to be instant. You don't do it now, two seconds, later you do and then somebody else will beat you and so you have to be always chasing a very short deadline to end up filing stories which uh, you're not very sure about and then later on you know, they the expect uh, uh, those people who are hurt to actually make the correction which is again i think quite, quite unfair 
you know, you make a serious charge against somebody, and then says that I'm giving you a chance to clarify yourself. I mean, they're supposed to doing it. They are, they're supposed to pull down that story. They're supposed to say that I'm sorry I did this, but these things, these practices are not there. You just do it because you have to do it. You 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 are chasing a deadline. And you have to beat your competitor, and you have to justify your being there. So you just write a story. Those kind of thing happen quite often, and and I think that is very sad. And the last point that I let me just conclude with one more point. Although I wanted to say so many things, so many more things, and also clarify on some some other points. Uh, the other thing I think is important for people in Manipur now is that you know uh, people here, as well as those people who are engaged in this particular, I think following this conflict think that this is very, very important. Of course, for, for those people who are involved, it's very important. But on the, and in fact, I also made a post today in, on, on my own page that, you know, for the rest of the India, for the rest of the world, this is just a tiny speck happening there. You know, and they will remember only when there's some big violence happening there. Nothing else will happen. Tomorrow will be forgotten. Now we have a, have a discussion at the IIC. Why didn't it? Why didn't we have a discussion before this conflict happened? We are we are doing it only now. So these conflicts are actually bringing us into the picture. And when we want to solve this problem, we cannot be actually expecting others to come and solve it for us. It is for those people in involved the stakeholders to actually come forward and then agree on on, on a principle of give and take, uh, on a principle of uh, win win situation. No, no, no zero sum game. You win, somebody else lose. That if you if you have that kind of situation, the other party will never agree. So it has to be a win-win kind of situation where you give and take, where you agree to a, a certain platform where both both can both parties of or, or more parties. Because I think uh, it's not a two-way equation in Manipur. We have uh, the cookies and the metes at the moment, but we also have the nagas who, who are also watching and who also have a big stake in this particular problem. And if you don't sell it well, maybe the, maybe the, the dimension of this conflict will, in, will, will actually multiply. It will, will in, include more people, and then it'll be more dangerous for everybody. More, su more sufferings will come about. So I don't think it is right for us to actually think in terms of you know, uh, uh, the victim perpetrator. It has to be uh, on, uh, on, on a basis of what uh, uh, the, uh, John Paul Ladrach has called the moral imagination, where you're talking about uh, your enemies, but when you hurt your enemy, uh, supposing you hurt a young man, you if you're able to think, does that young man also left a wife behind or left the children behind? If you're able to think in those terms, then immediately your horizon expands and then the peace message will come, will begin to sink in. So I think this moral imagination is very important. You're not seeing in terms of only eliminating your enemy. You're also thinking about an enemy who is also human. And when, once you are able to think of that, then the peace process will become visible. For the moment, when you just compare wounds, my my wounds are more hurtful than yours. My I was wrong, more wrong than you, but then uh, I wronged you. That kind of thing that will always increase that hostility, and there will be no, no solution in sight unless we are able to come out of that, come out of that equation, that binary kind of equation that one man loses, another one another one will have to lose. If we are unable to come out of that, I think it's going to be very disastrous for everybody. So I think it's time for all to think in terms of. In, the, in, in human terms of that and, and exercise that moral imagination and see what can be done. And that will, I hope it will come about soon so that everybody who's displaced can go back to their homes, wherever they were, they can go back to their homes and begin life again. It will not be easy. There, there are so many uh, losses, so many memories which have been jammed, so many uh, precious lives lost. For those people who have lost uh, lives, they will also have to come to terms with that because there's no way uh, anything else can be done. For those people who have lost property, maybe they can be compensation. But there's, uh, those people who have lost lives, again, we'll have to think. And, uh, and, and, and Pradeep, that's going thank to be you. Another. Thank you very much, uh, Pradeep, for that, for that uh, line of uh, moral imagination. I think that's the crux of the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. Now All we'll right. go, go to the last speaker, um, um, S.N. Sahu. No, go ahead. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Actually, I will begin by referring to uh, Joseph Bulliger. Joseph Bulliger famously stated that the, our Republican press would rise or fall together. I mean, this is what is happening. If the press is declining in India, as is, is, as is evidenced from the report, Press Freedom Index report, or what is happening in Manipur. If the republic is, if the press is falling, the republic is also falling. So in this context, 
you know, what has been talked about is the conflict situation. You know, A versus B or V versus C, this tribe versus that tribe, Nagas versus Muslims and so and so, whatever it is. Now, to address the problem that is being confronted in Manipur, we need to find out the commonalities of different tribes, different people coexisting there for several centuries. Now, in a conflict situation, whether media at any time has flagged the commonalities or not. I mean, I was quite impressed to read a report in the wire which stated that in Indian National Army of Netaji Subhas Bose, Kukis, Maites, Nagas, many of them worked, hundreds of them. This was a remarkable example of commonalities which was manifested in the freedom struggle, which was led by, I mean, at least in that part of the region by Netaji Subhas Bose. Now, this kind of commonalities were highlighted by Mahatma Gandhi in Delhi in several prayer meetings when the partition-related violence gripped the entire country. He went to jail to see the INS soldiers. And those INS soldiers, they told Gandhiji, we fought for India's independence, not as Hindus or Muslims or Sikhs but the Indians. But in the jail, they were served Hindu Pani and Muslim Pani. During pre-partition times, pre-partition time, or before independence, in railway stations, vendors used to sell Hindu Pani, Muslim Pani, Hindu Chai, Muslim Chai. Gandhi had written about those divisions, tea and water getting divided on the basis of religion. So when the INS soldiers asked, told Gandhi that we are being served Hindu tea, Muslim tea, Hindu pani, Muslim pani, we fought as Indians. Then Gandhi asked them, so how do you deal with the problem? When you get Hindu tea and Muslim tea, he said, we mix both Hindu tea and Muslim tea and then consume. Gandhi found a great example. So therefore the commonalities are found among ordinary people. The unsung heroes of the INA. So similarly, I'm sure there must be some commonalities. Commonalities. The other day, when some cookies were forcibly removed from him, file, there was a church leader who said, I forgive those people who are the black ships. That was a statement that was made. So I think that's the first act of reconciliation and understanding. You know, the other day, I, I last month I I just looked at a report in Hindu, scarce news, false news. It's a very interesting picture, I mean, news item. It says that there was an internet ban, but internet was being used to spread fake videos. So how did the internet work then? So the young fellow says they used to go to the Manipur Mizoram border, where internet was available. And they used to store internet data. And then videos were shared. And those videos were being shared through Bluetooth. And that resulted in a lot of acrimony and bitterness. So the point here is, you know, it, you know I'm, I'm, I was looking at today morning this, the second press commission report of India. There are only two press commissions so far. The second press commission report, there was a recommendation that was made in 78 that media has a role to play to prevent and deflate conflicts, communal conflicts particularly. Now, now it's an ethnic conflict. And so therefore, he said the response, freedom of the press and responsibility need to be complemented, need to be combined together. Now here, I mean, what we come to know about uh, Maripur reporting is that there has been fake news reporting, I mean, fake news content spreading all around. 
Now, whether any role has been played to prevent it? I mean, I remember when somebody was, I do not want to name, somebody was a lady was interviewed uh, by Karan Thapar. He said, what is required through the media channels is to sensitize the government to establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, Truth and Reconciliation Commission idea is obviously taken from Nelson Mandela's you know, example in South Africa. Actually, that to a great extent addressed the, the, you know, the apartheid problems, murder, mayhem, killing, discrimination, and so on and so forth. Now, here, except in that interview, I never heard anywhere in any media channel, the idea of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You know, Mr. Pradeep was telling, his sister-in-law was my colleague from Manipur in Rajya Sabha. So today I asked her, can you come here? I don't know where she has come, Pradeep Prabhita. She's a, she's a Maitai lady. Now she was saying, can this IAC meeting talk about peace at least? We have been completely broken by violence, bloodshed, and of course, the terrible brutalities inflicted on women. Now, any conflict, the worst victims of any conflict are women. So, so here, I mean, Supreme Court, when it took up the matter, they said all women judges, high court judges, was appointed. Did the government take any initiative? Did the media suggest such an idea that women should come together and go reach out to the women who have been the victims? No way it was done. I remember President Kiyar Narayanan, when he inaugurated a conference preventing disaster through information. It was in Vigyan Bhavan. So that time he said that these disasters like Manipur, or disasters like famine, they are all man-made. And therefore, Professor Amartya Sen once said, democracy and free press is the best guarantee against such disasters. Now, if democracy and free press is the best guarantee, this means if Manipur, the conflict is going on, I think today there is a report that some violence has taken place, three or four people have been killed. So this means there's no democracy, there's no free press. So if therefore in this context, what is important? I mean, who is, who is now talking about the commonalities in Manipur, commonalities among different you know, sections of the society, be it the tribes or the Nagas or the Muslims? Nobody is talking about the Muslims who, who might face the problems it is, it is sort of notice. You never know. It might spread to Mizoram. It might spread to other parts of the North where they are very sensitive regions of our country. So, I mean, the Prime Minister spoke only after that terrible, brutal video was circulated. Otherwise, probably, you know, the voices, senior voices would not have come forward. So, therefore, when I read about the Indian National Army, how they brought together all the tribes and all sections of society to fight for India's independence. So I'm sure there must have been great other examples. Many cookies must have saved, many maitis, maitis must have saved, many cookies. There are many examples which did the media flag that. So is this, uh, you know, uh, I, I remember when uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, thanks to Suhas's initiative, 12th November 1947, when Gandhi addressed the refugees who were there in uh, Kurukshetra, they came from Pakistan. So Gandhi, after, after that uh, first and last live broadcast over All India Radio, he was asked a question by a Hindustan Times correspondent. How was your experience? through radio. And Gandhi said, I saw God's Sakti in a microphone. Microphone is an instrument of power. 
Now that Sakti or microphone is an instrument of power, now we have, you know, infinite variety of that Sakti. And because of Suhas Burkar, I think the government, you know, declared 12th November 1940, 12th November is a public service broadcasting day. So whether the public service is being rendered by the newspapers. So that is a big question. And as you say, in a conflict situation, it's very tough to report. I mean, why there was internet ban? Right to connectivity has emerged as a human right. So when the connectivity, right to connectivity is disrupted, human right is disrupted, violated. So therefore, I'll just conclude by saying that we need to have, you know, commonalities. When Gandhi went to Noakhali, he flagged those commonalities and eventually peace was restored. I mean, we are not searching. I mean, it's very difficult to get a man like Gandhi. But point is, our leadership, whether from this party or that party or government or civil society, those commonalities need to be highlighted. And we are trying to get those commonalities. Because people are dying for peace, some kind of order, some kind of sanity and strength. So, therefore, it is important to focus on commonalities and focus on solidarity and peace. I think that is the message that we can harness through proper use of media. Thank you. Yeah, can we uh, pick up? Uh, uh, I think probably there's just time for about three questions. Uh, can we? Uh, uh, more, more, okay. Yeah. Come. Yeah. Just grab a mic. Yeah. No, just grab a mic. Will you catch him on the mic? Will you catch him on the camera? Just catch him on the camera. Yeah. I can't really do this. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Patricia, you mentioned about selective ban on internet. Can you just explain what it is? Yes, just coming. Just coming. Because uh, in the valley, I think internet was available, uh, at least in some parts of the valley. In the hills, it was completely cut off. So, as uh, somebody had said earlier, those in the hills had to go to the border to at least get their internet in order. That was what I meant. Can I have a question, please? Yeah. 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 yeah I'm uh, Saram Rojis. Uh, I'm actually a reporter uh, of the ISTV channel in Impal. So uh, I just want to give two, three very important informations. Uh, of course, there is like the border communities are fighting each other and uh, the communities are also bound to come in a certain things. Uh, like uh, there are still two journalists who is a Maitai and they're still missing. They went for a reportage and now still they're missing. Again, I was told that one of the five journalists was literally about to be killed and but they could not, they actually, you know, somehow escape. Uh, so it, the problem is that the internet is also not there. And then even in my channel, all the news correspondent of all the districts are there. Again, when you the internet is banned, then the news are also not coming from the particular district. And you cannot also go to go to that particular place to get the report. So since you're also a community, there's also a problem. There is one. Another thing is that in such kind of discussion, we can also discuss about think about how to bring peace in and reconciliation because we cannot allow such kind of violence in India. But in this conflict, there's not only two particular groups are involved. Another, another larger forces is also involved, that is state, because state has failed. When I say state, it is also deeper state of how the armies and Afghan rifles are taking role in this particular conflict. Like for example, why a particular army is inviting a media media group to write about a particular report on a particular community. So this they are playing politics on this conflict and state doesn't want to stop this conflict. And they wanted to continue this conflict so that they can play and militarize this region for a longer time. And there's also geopolitics that the state wanted to play particular community 
for a bigger role in Bangladesh, Burma, and Manipur. So they wanted to arm. So this is not a conflict between the two communities. And even people like sitting in Delhi here, we have to think that are we going to allow such conflict in India, in Manipur, or we should border it? Yeah, can I have one question, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Uh, yeah. My name is Sri and uh, I taught uh, you know Hill University for five years in the nineteen seventies. And I visited uh, the college right? yeah. yeah. often. Uh, quickly, uh, so, the, the, the whole uh, yeah. question of this Truth and Reconciliation Commission is referred to. As far as the apartheid con uh, uh, context is uh, considered, please remember that there was a person of the moral stature of Desmond Tutu who actually played that overall uh, moral leadership role. You had another Truth and Reconciliation Commission in uh, Sri Lanka after the Where did that go? Because you need to have community leadership, you need to have people of stature, which is exactly my point. Which I wanted to ask the question was that if you look at uh, you know so many things. Uh, that we admire about informal markets and so on, about many of the economy, I mean, productivity was contributed by women labor power over there. And, and so, therefore, what happened to that kind of a moralizing force? And, and when Patricia asked the question, where is law? Indeed. Where is order? Indeed. Where is chief minister? I would like to ask. Thank you. Yeah, can, I, can I ask one? Yeah. 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 So, my name is Mutum. I am in my final year PhD at Center for Media Studies, JNU. Uh, so uh, just a small commentary and then a question. The small commentary is that I think in terms of, yeah, very brief. In terms of establishing peace, I think the media need, uh, needs to be more proactive and not lazy enough to uh, look at things in, uh, in a very narrow minded dichotomy like what happens in North India between uh, Hindus and Muslims. The sort of, if you bring that sort of a frame in Manipur, I think then uh, you know, everything goes haywire. So I think you need to really get down to the bottom of it. And talking about getting to the bottom of it, for one, uh, it's not a uh, hill versus valley per se at all, because the Nagas are not involved, and Nagas are, I think, the biggest indigenous tribe, for example. Right? So you need to also address that when you're doing a media report. But you cannot always say it's a hill valley tribe, might they think it, it's not that at all. And then now the question is, uh, the question is that uh, if this is not related to narco-terrorism, right? It might be addressed to Ms. Petri, uh, Madam Patricia Mukum, or it might be addressed to uh, Professor Guite. You either of you can answer. If it is not related to narco terrorism, then why is the ZRA flag so much prominent in uh, the areas dominated by the Gopi right now? The ZRA, which are uh, controlling the Saigon region of Burma, which is uh, seeing the highest spike in uh, property plantation as well. So, why is it so prominently seen right now? If they will, you uh, answer that question, that would be very helpful. Uh, thank you, Sohas. I just want to make one correction. Uh, you know, I think one of the speakers raised the issue of the army somehow being involved in some mysterious way uh, in the conflict and in somehow uh, aggravating the conflict. I, I want to uh, point out that the army is a completely neutral and impartial party in this conflict. Uh, there is no other party that is on both sides. Uh, Army and the Sand Rifles are the only people who are on both sides. They don't have any particular stakes on favor of one side or the other. They have basically come in the defense of the victims, wherever they have been, whether it's Churachanpur or in Imphal. In Churachanpur, perhaps most people don't know that the only two people, the first two people who were killed in forces firing were of were cookies who were killed in the cross firing in which uh, even the army was involved. So let's be very clear. The army and the Assam rifles are the only party who are objective enough to be able to view both sides and to be able to judge both sides and not be on one side or the other. Every other party has a, uh, has a sectional view. The second uh, minor point that I think just is an illustration of the kind of disinformation that takes place very easily. I have great respect for Pradeep Bam. He's a very close friend. But he reported that in the incident today where three people were killed, they may have been in quotes terrorists. Firstly, there are they, these were cookies. There were two village volunteers and one musician who were killed. By no definition can they be called terrorists. There is no cookie group that is defined as a terrorist. Simply no cookie group that's defined as a terrorist. 
And in fact, there are six or seven Mete VBIGs, as they are called, who are brand, banned and proscribed, uh, you know, organizations. So there's clear misinformation and disinformation taking place uh, right here. And in fact, you know, there's a question that I have to pose to you, sir, uh, as the kind of organizer of this. What is the premise of this, uh, of this entire event that you're holding? If you see the brief, yeah. yeah, if you see the brief that you read out, it would appear that there's nothing wrong with the ground reality, that beheadings, rapes, uh, uh, MLAs being practically bashed up and killed and all that is uh, part of some kind of normal reality. You would not think that local reportage uh, is part of the reality. You would think that somehow it's the national media which is part of the problem. No, no, what I'm first... first wait, wait, wait. Just one second. Just identify yourself for the... Yeah, camera. I'm Gautam Mukhopadhyay. I'm a former ambassador of India. <laughs> I also addressed the question just, just posed here last. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to clarify that, uh, uh, you know, that the premise on which this is being held is completely faulty, that the real fault lies not in the national media, but in the local media, if you went by the local media, you would think that cookies have burnt a cookie boy in an ambulance. Uh, you would think that cookies have attacked cookie villages in which innocent metes suddenly happened to be there. This happened in Kamenlo and this happened in Kokin no, village. Yeah, fine, and the army letter clarifies yeah, this okay. very perfectly. Right? Okay? But now, one point, I'm sorry, since, 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 since you now, since you have raised the question of why we are doing this, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, I, I find the question very ridiculous. I answered. That's I not raised the last question which I raised was can a free press promote peace, reconciliation, understanding, and give the much needed healing touch where others have failed? That was the reason we had this meeting for. Okay. Right. Now, I don't want any arguments about it. Let's close that. No, sir. Yeah. Let's, let's close that. Yeah. Is there any the question of yes. drugs? I would just like to ask, who is the biggest drug? Uh, 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 no, they, they're not, they're enough, enough. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, very good evening to all of you. My name is Jonathan Latsan Guite. I'm a researcher here with the India International Center, and I'm also a JNU White. So uh, I was earlier working with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and with the National Human Rights Commission. My question is to Mr. Pr Mr. Pradeep Panjubam. I am from the Zou Koki community, common to Mizoram, Manipur, Paite, Zou Koki. So here I'm just going by the report of the United Nations yesterday. It says by mid August 2023, an estimated 160% have been reportedly killed, mostly from the Koki ethnic community, and over 300 injured. The conflict also reportedly resulted in tens of thousands of people from the communities being displaced. Now, where is he coming up with this data of saying that may more Metis villages have been displaced? So that's my first question. The second question is, if you want to get the facts correct about the number of people displaced and the people who are suffering is a majority Koki community, go to Mizoram. Mizoram is our grand Zo state. It is, it is Jerusalem of all the Zou Koki tribes. Mizoram is our brother state. Get information from the chief minister's office, from the CYMA, get information from the Zou Koki woman, uh, the ITLF, Indigenous Tribal Leaders Forum, and the Zou Koki Women's Forum. They will tell you. Thank you so much. Okay, let me answer that. I, I think you heard wrong because I think probably you are listening for the things that we, you wanted to hear. Because I didn't say anything about the displacement in the in the present conflict. I was only talking about displacement from the forest, you know, the, the eviction from the forest, and and the number of villages which are which were evicted, not uh, not related to the present conflict. So, but the, the uh, person who asked the question just now probably was listening only for the things that he wanted to hear. That's why he was asking me this, which are, which is what not not what I said. And also, uh, let me just answer uh, a little bit of what uh, Gautam Mukhapade said. I, I don't think there is any angel in this. No, no, not the army, not the not the assembly rifles. And for instance, when you talk about the Sioux, okay, he, uh, he was he was talking about there are no terrorists on the cookie side, but there are only terrorists on the media side. When and the Sioux, then why are they in, in that peace talk? They never had a fight with the Indian army. They never had a fight with the with the police, and yet they were brought into the Sioux. And the popular belief is that they were actually meant to control the Nagas, and and that is what uh, uh, that is why this uh, thing was extended to them because they were not fighting at all. They were not fighting the Indian state. They were waving Indian flags. They were also uh, when uh, 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 they weren't fighting the Nagas at that time when when this thing was when this uh, Sioux was agreed. So I I, I don't think it is, it is uh, so simple as that 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 that, uh, that that simple equation where one is a villain, the other is not. I, I think it's, it's, it is a, a common kind of problem that we are all facing here. And I think we have to look for the answer from that perspective, not from that, again, from that victim perpetrator and who's wrong and who's right and all that. We'll have to search for those answers, but from, from a platform which is neutral. And I think uh, 
the kind of aggressive kind of questioning, the aggressive kind of uh, uh, positioning this this particular conflict is not going to help at all. And I think uh, even from the last two questions, the uh, 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 per persons who asked the question, this thing is already visible. And they were only, only listening to what they want to hear. Uh, they were not actually uh, willing to hear all sides and, and then come to a conclusion where everybody is represented. Uh, rep represented. And, and this is basically the problem, it, even in reportage of, of uh, the, the, the particular conflict. And also when we are analyzing uh, the media, there are also papers coming out from Twitter, but we have to also analyze well, how those people are reporting and how those people in Imphala are reporting because they have their own limitations. They have their own inclinations. In the, in the initial stages, when the divide was not so big, I don't think the problem was much. When the divide became so hard, then, then there are so many difficulties from both sides. The pressures, the dangers, the intimidations would be happening on both sides. And those kinds, I think those also have to be taken into account when we assess journalism, the journalists who are reporting conflict. Okay, when, as I said in the beginning, there are limitations on both sides. People flying in from outside without understanding the problem, actually reporting about the problem. People who are involved in the problem, who are writing as a subject of that particular, as a... Uh, as as a writer in a subject position, as as uh, Dominic La Capra says in his uh, book, writing history and writing, writing trauma, how difficult it is. I think we have to be looking at those uh, these problems from those angles, from those angles which uh, identify the problem, and and uh, and not as uh, not in those binary equations. As I said in the, in my in my talk also that, uh, that that it's not always that binary 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 equation, it, especially when you're talking about life, and and conflict is part of life. Is is always a multi-dimensional kind of a problem, and we have to be look. We have to be taking that into account when you have to assess a three-dimensional situation on a linear, linear and and unidimensional plane. Then I think there's everything is going to go wrong. When the diagnosis is wrong, I don't think the the subscription is all, also going to be right. And I think the problem will continue if we, unless we are able to come down and actually uh, see from that from that perspective, we sees everything, not just one side. I want to respond to that gentleman there who wants to know if that is the key problem. I'm afraid I don't have the answer. I have not been part of any fact-finding team. We need a completely independent fact-finding team. And I do not understand why the state-constituted team that was supposed to be led by a retired judge of Pohati High Court has not come up with anything yet because they were given a timeline of three months they still haven't come up even with a preliminary report. So I'm no, in no position to answer your question. I, I think, uh, yeah, no, I, I think there's uh, not much time now. And I say a few words. Yeah. Yeah, just my concluding, sorry, Rima. Like, uh, I believe that the solution to this problem lies in the problem itself. So like we have our four pillars of democracy in India. So Manipur government in a similar way have these four pillars on which the government is running. One is the UGs, the social groups, pressures, and then uh, the politicians and the drug syndicates. So the problem is this and the solution also lies in this. That's my conclusion. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, you see, I, I, I just know, I'm sorry, now you're just running too much. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, you know, he made a comment. There was no question. He yeah. just. Yeah. So, uh, you see, I, I, I just want to flag this, uh, uh, what I came across and what uh, Patricia began with that uh, uh, media persons who, who are uh, covering. Uh, uh, conflict uh, uh, situations. So uh, there is this uh, report which I came across of a media training on conflict sensitive practices. Uh, this was on a uh, uh, meeting which was held on the 23rd of June 2023 in Mombasa, Kenya. You know, so there is a participant who mentions this, and this needs to be flagged. He says, We provide information, and in absence, there will be rumors, and that will throw the conflict further. We are mandated to come up with credible information that will not leave any information vacuum. 
to allow the spread of disinformation and misinformation. The other critical point made was that the fundamentals, the five W's and H, and now they are how, and now they have added a so what. We should never forget these things when we are reporting. We should avoid being emotional and identify the groups by the names they identify themselves with. We agreed to avoid the use of words like terrorists, rebels. We all identified with the need for journalists to be neutral. In a conflict setting, most people say it is difficult to be neutral, but the calling of journalists is to be impartial and objective in reporting. So I think that uh, what you, Patricia, began with, that uh, you say that when you are in a conflict zone, you must be ex extremely sensitive to uh, the, the, the both sides of that conflict. I mean, there could be uh, there could be three sides, there could be four sides, but you must be extremely sensitive to that. And that that we at, at the moment what we see is we are lacking in that sensitivity. So th thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, we've been all very patient. And thank you. And I think uh, the main idea for this meeting, I mean, since the, the, there's been a question on why this meeting was held, it was to build peace. <coughs> that was our only motive. Thank you very much. I was really hoping to say something. <laughs> Thank you.